I couldn't even describe it. So I did test him. I want him to suffer. He's worse than the monster. Who's the evil of the evilest? This is 12-year-old Tia Sharp. In August 2012, her decomposing body was found in the loft of her grandpa, Stuart Hazel. But that's not all the police found that day. There are a few people worse than Stuart. Years before, he had chosen Tia as his prey, and his wife knew nothing about it. Tia knew more hardship than most kids her age, and sadly, no amount of red flags would make her family prevent her tragic fate. Before we go on, guys, I must warn you, this case is not for the faint-hearted. We'll discuss graphic details, perversion, and death. This is the full story of Tia Sharp. Our story begins in South London, UK, with a happy-go-lucky girl. Tia Christine Sharp was born on June 30, 2000, to Stephen and Natalie in Croydon, South London. Natalie was still a teenager when she had her daughter, and raising Tia would not be easy for her. However, she was determined to be a kind and supportive mom. She was tiny. So holding her was like a Christmas present, you know, when you get what you actually asked him for. When Tia was still a baby, though, her parents split up and Stephen moved away. They knew they weren't ready to be a family, but Stephen loved his daughter a lot. So he spent a lot of time with his Tia. But there was someone else in the immediate family, Christine, Natalie's mom. Tia spent so much time with Christine that she sometimes called her mom. I was there when she was born. I saw Tia born. It was my first grandchild. Uh, that was untold love, that was it. Nothing was taking that away. The three of them were best friends. And there were times Natalie forgot that she was actually Tia's mom. Obviously it was a mother and daughter bond, but I wouldn't have said that it was a mother and daughter bond. I would have said that she was more like my best friend. This would pay off in many ways. Aged 12, Tia was super confident, talented, and always eager to make new friends. However, Tia's school was often concerned about her super low attendance. In 2008, when Tia was just eight, social services were sent to the house. There, officers discovered that Natalie's boyfriend was smoking a lot of weed. They noted a few other things and concluded in the report that Tia's family was dysfunctional. However, the report didn't mention neglect or abuse towards Tia. It was just a tiny slap on the wrist for Natalie, who seemed to be struggling with her love life. For a brief couple of weeks, Natalie had also gone out with a man named Stuart Hazel. That didn't work out, but in 2002, Stuart ended up hitting it off with Christine. Yup, Natalie's mom. Christine worked at a Southwest London pub and Stuart was one of her regulars. With Christine, Stuart was charming and funny, but there were a lot of red flags about him from the get-go. With Hazel, there's lots of dysfunctional factors in his background, lots of risk factors. Um, first of all, he had a difficult relationship with his parents. His mother was a prostitute, his dad was in prison, so therefore he went into care at a young age. It gets even darker. When he was 16, Stuart was he was never able to shake off that trauma. When somebody has suffered trauma in childhood, psychological trauma, physical trauma, that can lead to them using violence as the first response to any challenge that they have. Paired with his mother's work, this was a recipe for disaster. Stuart had a long history of criminal offenses, but Christine knew nothing about this. We see drug offenses, cocaine um, offenses, dealing we see criminal damage, we see burglary, we see theft, and we also see violence. Um, there was racially motivated violence and GBH in his background. That's grievous bodily harm. But all Christine knew about Stewart's past was that he'd consumed a lot of drugs and alcohol and those days were behind him, he said. He was never aggressive towards Christine and he seemed to be a good parental figure for Tia too. So in 2007, he moved into Christine's house just down the road from Tia and Natalie. But as soon as he was in a safe space, Stuart started to reveal his true colors. He started abusing drugs and alcohol and getting into violent fights outside his home. In 2010, he was convicted of carrying a machete and was sentenced to 12 months in prison. Still, Christine stood by his side and defended his personality. It's like a gentle giant. I mean, obviously, I mean, 
I know he had a criminal record. I know he. I know he drunk. I know he smoked weed, but I didn't know the extent. Um, but as I said to him, what he'd done in his past before we met, that, that was nothing to do with me. Poor Christine really thought Stewart's criminal days were behind him, even when he was in prison. So when he was released, Christine welcomed him back home. He was so trusted and so close to the family. Tia even called him grandpa. In 2012, the Sharp family was bigger and happier. Natalie now had two other children with her new partner, Tia was doing better in school, and Christine and Stuart were the extra set of parents Tia loved having. He was good to her, I can't, he made her smile. He was good with the kids, he was good at the, with the house. He, I don't know, at some point he was everything that she needed. For Tia, Stuart was a role model. She idolized him, you know, like, I wish she didn't, and I wish part of her did hate him, but the fact was she never did. She couldn't wait to be around him, she idolized him, and. He did her. On June 30th, 2012, Tia celebrated her 12th birthday. Natalie and Christine were going to take Tia to a nearby town for a weekend trip. When they asked her what friend she wanted to bring along, she said Stuart. She could have picked anyone her age, and she chose her grandpa. There is a real tragedy in this relationship. Here we have a young girl who fully trusts her grandfather, loves her grandfather, enjoys spending quality time with him. The polarities of viewpoint from what Tia sees him as to what Hazel actually is are so at odds with each other. On August 2nd that summer, Tia texted Stuart. She wanted to come by and spend a few nights at his house. Stuart never said no to Tia. I received a text message on the phone from Stuart saying that Tia could stay there if she wanted to. Mum weren't going to be there. Like, it was up to her with that. I remember shouting to Tia. I was on the toilet. I remember shouting, reading out the message. And she just jumped off the kitchen side with a yes, 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 went into the bedroom, done whatever she was doing, got changed or whatnot. And that was it. Excited, Tia packed a small backpack and went to meet Stuart at the Addington train station. The two went shopping together before returning home. I wish I hadn't have read the text message. I wish I hadn't have read it out to her. I wish I told her no, she wasn't staying there. I blame myself. If I hadn't have read the reply, she wouldn't have gone. That evening, Christine was away, but she called home to talk to Stuart. He said he was playing on the PS4, and Christine could hear Tia in the background saying, no, I'm playing on the PS4. Tia laughed, and Christine knew all was fine. But that was the last time anyone heard Tia's voice. On August 3rd, Christine came home from work and asked Stuart where Tia was. Stuart calmly said she was out in Croydon buying flip-flops. But by 6 p.m., Christine and Natalie knew something was wrong. Perhaps Tia had gotten lost in Croydon, or maybe someone had snatched her. When they called and messaged her, she didn't pick up. We drove around for a little while, and I was just at 10 o'clock saying it just, there was too much time. I shouldn't have waited that long, but again, I did because I was hoping, you know, just hoping that the tram was late or she was what she was with a friend. At 10 p.m., Natalie, Christine, and Stuart turned up at the local police station and filed a missing person report. It was pretty clear to the mother and daughter that Stuart cared just as much about finding Tia. He seemed worried, seemed as frantic as I was, but didn't say much. He reacted normal, but he he knew where she was. He knew what she, he had done. Nothing slipped. No one suspected a loving grandpa who accompanies the rest of his family to the police station. Stuart was the last person to see Tia, though. So he told the police he'd last seen her midday, August 3rd, before she left for Croydon. On top of Stewart's account, a neighbor told the police he'd seen Tia leave Stewart's home. That was the perfect alibi for him. The police had to be certain though, so they obtained a search warrant for Stewart's house. To their relief, there was nothing strange inside. The house had been searched by a search team. A simple human error from an officer who was inexperienced and perhaps not properly trained for that role, it had led to the body not being found. Yep, 
Tia's body was composing upstairs in the loft where no one thought to look. The search for Tia was long and harrowing. The police were looking for any place but Stewart's house, having cleared him of suspicion. And Tia's family was desperately asking people for witness accounts, clues, even thoughts and opinions, anything that could point them in Tia's direction. I found it physically hard to believe that Tia had gone missing and not one person saw her. Within days, Tia was being searched for all over the UK. The Croydon community was especially involved in the search, holding candlelit vigils and putting up posters and leading everyone was Stuart. Often what we see with offenders who are very manipulative and show traits of antisocial personality is when the media descends because um, somebody is missing and they know that they've killed them, they actually seek the publicity. And they're getting something from that. At that point, he's thinking he's very clever. Being at the center of attention, Stuart became a controversial figure. Some papers argued that he was the last person to see her alive, so perhaps he knew more than he was letting on. Stuart's response? He invited ITV to his home to accuse these papers. They believe what they read in the papers, they can do whatever they like, because I know deep down in my heart that Tia walked out of my house. They're just going on what he's saying, and when they say, you say something, they twist your words. Do you know what I mean? I'd love to sit there and they ask me stupid questions yesterday, like, oh, did you do anything? I said, well, no, I bloody didn't. Excuse my language, but no, I didn't. I'd never think of that. I'd love her to bitch. She's like my own daughter. For God's sake, we had that sort of relationship. Stewart even comforted Christine as she despaired over missing her granddaughter. But a week into Tia's disappearance, Christine would make the most horrifying discovery. Friday morning I got up and the smell was really intense. Um, once again, I, I was looking and I just couldn't find it. And I, I was pulling everything out, but I just could not find the smell. And then when the police turned up and that's when they just said to me, can we leave the house? On the morning of August 10th, the police searched Stuart and Christine's home for a fourth time. This time, they came out with a bag. Tia's decomposing body had been wrapped in duct tape and trash bags and hidden inside the loft. A week had gone by and the plastic and the summer heat had turned her body into unidentifiable remains. The forensics team had to confirm her identity through dental records. It was pretty clear who the police had to arrest. The cops tracked Stuart miles away in a Canning Hill shop buying vodka. So what can you tell me about the murder of Tia Sharp, Stuart? Stuart? As he was taken away to jail, dozens of people waited on the street to curse him and throw things at the car. If that's how the people of London felt, imagine how Natalie and Christine felt. I wanted to kill him. I prayed that one of them people got their hands on him before the police did. As the detectives researched Stuart, it only got worse. As it turns out, Stuart had an obsession with adult content involving minors. He had been searching for internet sites. Some of his searches were naked little girlies, schoolgirl rape, incest sex, violent forced rape. He was looking at um, illegal underage incest pictures, daddy and daughter incest pictures, girls with glasses, little girls, and he would have been using that as part of his fantasies. His last search for such a video was just days before the discovery of Tia's body. This means that while Stuart was acting like a desperate grandpa looking for his granddaughter, he was actually getting off on killing Tia. After returning from prison, Stuart had developed a sick interest with Tia. She was his fantasy. There's no doubt in my mind that Hazel became fascinated by Tia convinced himself that Tia loved him. For a while, Stuart would peek at Tia dress up, undress, or shower. Tia felt comfortable around him. He'd known her since she was two years old. For her, he was her granddad. She had no idea just how he pictured her in his mind. As Tia got older, as she was developing into a young woman, his behavior and his feelings changed towards Tia. For him, Tia is growing into a young woman that, as far as he is concerned, is becoming somebody of sexual 
sexual interest. Then, voyeurism wasn't enough for him. Stewart began filming Tia while she was applying body lotion to her legs. Then he filmed her asleep in her bed. In that creepy recording, he also took a moment to film his own looming shadow on the wall. He enjoyed the power, the feeling of controlling her in a way she never suspected. Within months, Stewart set up a spy hole from the bathroom into Tia's room. And when Christine was away for the weekend, he acted on his worst impulses. Stewart's story to the cops was that he'd passed out from drinking. When he woke up, he found Tia had fallen down the stairs and died. Feeling guilty, he tried to cover it up. But the police found Stewart's pictures hidden on a memory card inside his home. The very last picture he took was of Tia's naked body manipulated into a graphic position. This image depicted a naked female on all fours with the photograph being taken from behind her. It gets even darker. The police uncovered a vibrator from the house and sent it for DNA testing. It had Tia's DNA and blood on it. Her step-granddad had hurt her in the worst possible way. I couldn't even describe it. I did test him. I want him to suffer. He's worse than the monster. He's the evil of the evilest. Stewart never admitted his guilt. He even sent a letter to his dad containing the same bogus story he'd told the cops. There was no evidence that Tia would have fallen down the stairs, no head injuries, no hemorrhage, nor damage to the spinal cord. At his trial, Tia's family had to see the gut-wrenching photos Stewart had taken of Tia shortly after violating and killing her. Five days into the trial, Stewart changed his plea to guilty. At 11 o'clock, the legal teams and the judge came back into court. Stuart Hazel stood in the dock. Lord Carlisle asked uh, that the jury be brought in. Lord Carlisle, Stuart Hazel's defense barrister. The jury came in and he asked that the indictment, the charge, be put to Stuart Hazel again, the murder charge uh, of Tia Sharp. At that point, it was put to him again. There was a pause as he stood in the dock. He then said, guilty. Um, at that point, there were some gasps and cries from the public gallery where Tia Sharp's family have been sitting. Stuart Hazel was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 38 years, though it's pretty unlikely he'll ever get parole after this. Tia's dad, Stephen, had asked for the death penalty. Called for the death penalty? Yes. I mean, I've been in touch with my local uh, MP about this. And he, he seems that I've got a very good, strong case to write to David Cameron. Stephen's message is simple. Cases like these need to raise awareness on a global level. There were so many red flags about Stewart. His substance abuse, his 30 criminal charges, his violent tendencies. He hid these the best he could, but his true personality seeped through every now and then. Had Natalie and Christine taken this more seriously, or had the police convicted him earlier for consuming content, Tia would still be alive. But whoever imagines they share a roof with a monster? All right, guys, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in a comment. And before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and click that bell button so you never miss another episode. See you next time and keep yourself and your loved ones safe.